Now the official game might not be out for a couple more days but I just couldn't resist so in today's video we're going to be covering all the key kind of fixtures and players you should be looking to target and we're going to run through my first ever mock draft for the 24-25 season. Now before we dive into today's draft I just want to say that we are trying to hit 6,000 subscribers on the channel before the start of the Premier League season so if you do enjoy any of the content that you see on the channel please be sure to like, comment and subscribe. We've got plenty more Premier League and FPL content coming your way over the next few weeks and if you don't want to miss out be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification as well so you will be notified when I do go live. So let's start off first taking a look at the fixtures. Obviously this is a key point. I'm a big fan of obviously targeting strong fixtures. Now obviously some of the fixtures that I am suggesting we potentially target might change as kind of the summer progresses. We get more team data. We find out maybe about injuries and stuff like that so it can all change and flow but right at this current moment let's talk about some teams I think potentially should be worth targeting when the game does drop so for me personally obviously Liverpool looking very very strong with their fixtures they've got Ipswich Brentford Manchester United away not the easiest but again we know obviously how they are third last season Nottingham Forest Bournemouth Wolves Palace really really good start to the season for them in terms of fixtures United don't have the worst fixtures Fulham Brentford Liverpool Southampton Palace that's not a bad opening five Newcastle further down from them they've got a great opening five in my personal opinion Southampton Bournemouth Tottenham who interestingly they've got a very very strong record um, kind of against especially at home as well Wolves and Fulham in there Nottingham Forest another team as well definitely worth some consideration with a strong opening three maybe if you can find some players as well that do rotate around four and maybe five if Brent uh, Brighton sorry look quite Quite good at the start of the season could be you know worth holding on to a few of their assets for potentially a little bit longer as well I think Aston Villa might be worth a little bit of consideration after match day two when they face Arsenal obviously the opening game against West Ham you probably would favor them but with it being away and then Arsenal at home the next game I'm not too keen on their assets but after that, match day three, all the way up and probably till about match day nine. Realistically, I would fancy them to go and beat Manchester United. So up until match day nine, I think they are definitely a team also potentially on the radar for us to be considering as well with our opening drafts. Obviously, there's other teams that have nice kind of patches of fixtures, but those for me personally feel like the top teams we should be looking to target. So let's move on. Let's take a look at something I've been working on behind the scenes. It's goalkeeper day. Now, for me personally, I get a lot of questions asked about what to do with goalkeepers, who are the best goalkeepers, you know, should I take a minus four to replace my goalkeepers, should I use transfers to replace my goalkeepers, and for, throughout the course of last season and throughout the Euros fantasy as well, I've kind of always suggested to people, don't ever take a minus for a goalkeeper, don't ever transfer a goalkeeper unless it's absolutely essential, and you know what, the data I've done backs up my decisions goalkeepers just don't score well like they just don't the highest scoring goalkeeper as you can see last season was Jordan Pickford now with this data that I've got here it obviously has some of the prices obviously we're still waiting for a few goalkeepers prices to come in but these realistically for me are probably going to be the top owned goalkeepers in the game come the start of it so we've got saves per 90 because obviously every three saves you get an extra point Points against the top six. Now, obviously, what I'm going to suggest to you is only buying one goalkeeper and have a four million one for the other one. Usually, people try to rotate and obviously have fixture pairings, but I'm going to suggest against that, and I will come on to talk about that one as well. XG conceded. Obviously, this is the amount of expected goals they're facing per 90. The number of clean sheets they actually picked up last season, and then their points per 90, or basically with goalkeepers, per appearance, because they all pretty much basically play 90 minutes I think the only one who was the exception to that rule was Ariola and Martinez who I think were substituted but that's obviously been factored into the data so let's run through some saves per 90 and the big standouts for me are teams that obviously were towards the top end of the table and had better expected goals across the course of the season face less shots 
that means your goalkeepers are getting less points. So for me already, that rules out some of the premium goalkeepers like Raya and Edison as well, because they're just not facing as many shots. So they're automatically going to lose out on less points because they're just not getting as many saves per 90 and facing as much XG as, as you can see. Obviously, uh, Edison at 0.89 and Raya at 0.7. So definitely just already, if you're looking at either of those two goalkeepers when the game launches, get rid of them. ASAP. Now for me, the interesting points that we can see here are obviously around some of the goalkeepers points per 90. Looking at Jordan Pickford, there was a reason he was the top last season. Yes, Everton did quite well in the clean sheets, but also his saves. And it's also the points against the top six, which definitely helped him, you know, secure that top place as well. We can see it with some of the other goalkeepers as well, around that cheaper price point. Flecken with 31 as well. Onana with 31. Obviously, uh, Emi Martinez as well with 36. A lot of these goalkeepers that most weeks we probably wouldn't have even played against top six sides have done quite well. So that to me suggests that when we have these fixture pairings and just trying to target, you know, the better defensive data or something like that, for me personally, it just feels like a bit of a waste of time. And what we actually should be doing is find a team that are pretty well set up defensively. Their goalkeeper still has to make some saves and they also have the potential for some clean sheets and have quite a good kind of system set up for when they play against the top six sides. Now, obviously, if Jordan Pickford was at that 4.5 million, he would have been my banker, my go-to, because Everton, under Sean Dyche, they know how to set up. They know, obviously, as we can see from last season, how to obviously keep out top six sides with Jordan Pickford doing extremely well against uh, you know those top teams as well. But for me, I think the goalkeepers we're going to be looking at this season are Flecken, Ariola and Verbergen. Obviously, we're still waiting to find out if Verbergen is going to come in at that 4.5 million. Ariola was a very popular pick last season, as you can see, had the highest saves per 90 on this list. David Moyes' system did crumble towards the back end of the season. I definitely think that was evident as well with some of their poor results and him only picking up four clean sheets as well. So defensively, not the best. Verbergen, we're still waiting for his price point and obviously waiting to see what happens with their other goalkeepers as well. Last season, De Zerbi was quite heavy on rotation, so I think that one might play out over pre-season. But the only goalkeeper that I'm really, really keen on is Flecken. Obviously, as we'll come on to see with the draft, he's going to be our goalkeeper. Saves per 90, very, very similar to Jordan Pickford. Brentford as well did have quite a lot of defensive injuries last season. Obviously, they're going to have the likes of Ben Mee back, Pinnock back, Henry back as well. Historically, over the course of their time in the Premier League as well, they've always been one of those sides that massively overachieves in terms of points and also in terms of their performances against top six sides as well. They've got some very, very famous wins against Manchester City. City, Arsenal, Liverpool, you know, they've beat a lot of the big boys over the course of their Premier League stay. Thomas Frank and the Brentford side know how to set up against these top six sides. So with us just having the one playing goalkeeper, that means as well that we're going to have to play them against the top six sides. And I feel very comfortable with the way that Brentford set up that he could obviously go and pick up maybe some mega hauls as well against those top six sides. Clean sheet wise as well, still picked up seven last year despite the defensive injuries and despite Brentford being a little bit poor but for me he is going to be our number one goalkeeper pick and the goalkeeper pick I'm going to be recommending to people across the course of preseason. and to be honest my narrative throughout preseason as well is going to be to select a 4.5 million goalkeeper and just have no other goalkeeper on the bench I'd obviously have like the second choice goalkeeper from that side so you're definitely covering yourself kind of if they get injured you've still got yourself a playing goalkeeper but for me looking at the data looking at the stats there isn't any kind of reason to spend that extra 0.5 million on another rotating goalkeeper at 4.5 or up in the goalkeeper up to a 5 million option in my personal opinion and that is going to be the narrative that I'm going to tell you guys throughout the course of this pre-season. Right let's move on let's take a look at captaincy and obviously the premium assets around it. Now for me, there's been a lot of discussion, obviously, with Erling Haaland having his massive price hike up to 50 million, whether or not he is worth it. And for me, with captaincy, yes, yes, he is worth it because he still underperformed on his XG. He still finished the Golden Boot winner and he still managed to pick up some mega hauls. And with captaincy, that is why he is going to, you know, basically earn his keep. Same with Mohamed Salah as well. He's staying around the 12.5 million, quite a pricey 
uh, point for him as well. But he did achieve over 200 points. Now, for me, realistically, the captain captaincy matrix that we're going to go with over the opening couple game weeks is basically going to go like this. Mohamed Salah in game week one. Then we're going to move to Erling Haaland in match day two. We've got a toss up between West Ham and Manchester United. I guess we'll have to see over the opening couple week two weeks for me personally, which defence looks a little bit weaker. Obviously, new manager in Lopetegui. There's going to be a new back line at Manchester United. So whichever one looks a little bit more questionable, probably that's who will get the armband for that one. Maybe if we look at projected points at that point as well, see which player is projected to potentially do more. You'd imagine Erling Haaland, so it probably would be him. Or we might look at other alternative assets come match day three as well. Match day four is an interesting one. Both players at home. Brentford, though, like I said, do have quite a you know historic record of putting in some impressive performance against top six sides. So probably would go for Mohamed Salah on that one. Then, obviously, we are going to go start for back-to-back -back games against Bournemouth and Wolves with Erling Haaland having Arsenal and Newcastle. Then realistically, we're going to stick with the big man for the next four weeks after that at Fulham, Wolves, Southampton and Bournemouth because Mohamed Salah's run, Crystal Palace, they looked a lot better towards the back end of last season. Chelsea, Arsenal, Brighton and Aston Villa is very, very difficult. And around that point as well, interestingly, I think, let me just check the data here. Crystal Palace, it's match day seven. And at that point, Arsenal in match day six play Leicester, then they play Southampton, then they play Bournemouth. So realistically, you could scrap that Wolves game for Mohamed Salah and bring in Bakayo Saka at that point, offering you again that alternative captain option. Because that for me is what we should be doing with our two premium assets. Because realistically, we're not going to be able to get free this season with some of the pricing we've seen so far from FPL. It is going to be a two premium structure, and that is the kind of structure that I'm going to be looking to aim for the remainder of the season. The reason I'm going to do this, it always gives me a high premium player that can go out and get the mega hauls with strong fixtures as well. So I think that's going to be the narrative for this season. It is going to be rotating between two premium assets predominantly as well especially with Erling Haaland having that street steeper price point but let me know what you think about all this data and all this research I've done so far in the comments section and let's move on to the draft itself and the moment you have all been waiting for, it is my first mock draft of the new season. So let's start off with our goalkeepers. Obviously, I think from the last section, you know who's going to be in net for me. It is going to be Flecken. Obviously, I spoke about him and obviously the data I've done. He's going to be our goalkeeper for the course of the season, probably up until we wildcard and then maybe have a look, see how Brentford are doing kind of from a defensive standpoint in terms of their data and his kind of projected points and how he's doing at that point. But for me, he's going to be our starting goalkeeper. The other one is just a 4 million one because I couldn't find the other Brentford goalkeeper in the game, but we've just gone for that. We've just gone for the 4 million goalkeeper and the 4.5 million one. I obviously feel I spoke quite a lot about goalkeepers in the last section, so I'm going to keep this one quite brief right let's move on to our defenders obviously we're going to start off with the ones in the squad then we'll talk about the ones on the bench Fabian Shear, I'm very, very happy to have him. Newcastle were a team I highlighted in the fixtures. Great opening run for me personally. They've got Southampton, Bournemouth, uh, and then obviously a difficult test against Tottenham, but I've obviously spoke about the good record they have there. Wolves and Fulham, City, Everton, you know, after that point, we're probably going to start to remove the Newcastle assets at that point. But for me, he has a very, very good start opening two games as well, so I'm very, very happy to have him. Always a threat from set pieces as well, and currently, 4.5 million in the game in this game but let's wait and see when his price is revealed how much he'll actually come in at moving on to our next defender it is going to be Mark Gahey now obviously if Muniz is coming in around 4.5 million we're still waiting to see his price he definitely will be the option I would be going for we've still got 0.5 million left over in the bank as well so he probably will be the one that I will go for because I'm a very very big fan of him watching some of the positions he got into last season he will be on the end of some absolute mega hauls but for now, we're going with Mark Gahey. It's a mixed bag start in terms of Palace, but they got Brentford, West Ham, uh, Chelsea, Leicester. It's okay. It's okay. There's some all right fixtures in there. Again, let's see how Palace do at the start of this season, but I am backing them from a defensive standpoint. But we do have some decent players as well with good rotating fixtures as well on the bench and, of course, in the starting lineup. Moving on to Esri Konza. Again, Ian Matteson is in the game at 5 million. It would require us to potentially take some downgrades further up the field, but obviously I'm waiting to see how he performs in preseason before potentially bringing him into the side. But Konza's in here. 
Uh, Aston Villa have some really, really good fixtures, like I spoke about, after match day three as well. You would imagine with some of the signings that they've made, they would be looking to push on from this season, get themselves back into that Champions League and start to challenge some of the traditional big boys towards the top end of that season if they obviously want to compete with obviously the, the kind of the structure and everything that's going around the club as well. So I'm very, very happy to have Esri Konza in there. Moving on to our two bench defenders, we've got Castagna. Now Fulham have a difficult opening game against Manchester United, but then they play Leicester, Ipswich, West Ham, Newcastle in match day four, so he probably would back Fabian Shearer in that one. Forest in five, City, Villa then, uh, but then it's Everton, Brentford, Palace and Wolves. So he could be one of those players that realistically we just rotate around with other defenders as well within our side. Fulham traditionally as well have kind of been a mid-table team. Castagna has picked up the odd attack in return and if he comes in at 4.5 million, I think he could potentially be a nice differential pick that not a lot of people are potentially looking at. Obviously, oh, not, 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 not my mic over uh, obviously our last pick is going to be Harwood Bellis they play Forest and Brentford Ipswich and Bournemouth within their opening six games if Southampton look decent I think he's a very, very good option at 4 million. We covered him in the uh, the promoted players one as well. He's actually got okay attacking data as well for a centre-back. So maybe, you know, been scoring some set pieces down in the championship and could replicate that in the Premier League as well. So that's going to cover off our defence. Now let's move on into the midfield. I've put Eze in here. I have looked at the Palace fixtures and I, you know... <laughs> I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant on Eze. He is my boy, but obviously there's transfer talk. There's rumours obviously circulating him as well. There are some other players that I'm potentially thinking about as well that could be more suited to maybe going against Eze, but I'm going to wait and see when the full games that game comes out, whether or not he is going to remain within this side. But for now, I'm a very, very big fan of Eze. If you didn't know, I obviously loved owning him at the back end of uh, the last season. Didn't enjoy owning him at the start of the season, though. He was a bit of a troll, but hopefully he can obviously provide some very, very good kind of uh, attacking uh, output for us and our side as well. Moving on to the next one, coming in at 5.5 million. It is hudson Adoy. Forest have some pretty decent, okay-ish opening five fixtures. And what we get with him as well is a really, really good attacker at a nice price point. The 5.5 million range seems to be where a lot of kind of these mid-table, bottom-half teams attacking midfielders are priced this season. As you can see, we've got Semenyo on the bench as well. He's also coming in at that 5.5 million, but we'll talk about him a little bit later. But hudson Adoy picked up two assists today in a pre-season friendly against Chesterfield. I think towards the back end of the season, he was starting to grow. Looks like he's, you know, Forrester going to play an attacking front three this season with Chris Wood, him in there as well. He's obviously got uh, Gibbs White feeding them the balls as well. I think he could be a very, very decent shout at 5.5 million and maybe going that little bit under the radar. Moving on to a player I absolutely adored owning last season. It is Anthony Gordon, one of the best home records for any player player in the game last season they take on Southampton in the opening game so that to me seems like a recipe for success he's at that 7.5 million again when the fixtures do start to fall to the Newcastle there's plenty of other players decent players as well at 7.5 million so we can very easily switch around if Anthony Gordon's potentially form doesn't pick, pick up or if, you know, we just want to move him on because the fixtures aren't that good. Moving on to our captain for match day one. It is going to be Mohamed Salah. I know, obviously, a lot of people are talking about how is the system going to work. We're going to have to wait and see in pre-season. But he did manage to hit that 200-point mark yet again last season. It was one of his lowest scores over the past few seasons. And definitely since he came back from AFCON, he doesn't quite look the same player. So maybe let's wait and see how he gets on in pre-season. But I imagine he is going to be in the team and he will be captain for match day one for me personally because I think he is the best option for that game week. Moving on to our final midfielder on the bench, I briefly spoke about him, it is Semeno. I think he had a great season at Bournemouth last year as well. Their opening fixtures, they're kind of like mishmash if you like. So he's definitely going to be one of those players with hudson Adoy that are kind of just swapping around in and out of the team. Obviously they've got Chelsea and Liverpool in four and five, so not the greatest there, but they have Everton in match day three, Forest in one, 
Uh, Southampton in six, uh, Leicester in seven. So again, for me, like I said, there's a lot of players around that 5.5 million po point. And with those, he is just going to be coming in and out of the side when we need him. And obviously when the fixtures do completely fall away, we will swap him out for a different 5.5 million because there's so many good ones at that price point. Right, let's move on to our front line. We're going with Darwin Nunes and I put him in here and I, I'm just like, yeah. I'm, I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with it for now. But Darwin has been cooking over the international break. If you haven't noticed, in the Copper America, he was sensational. He's been great for Uruguay. Maybe this kind of change in new manager, maybe a change in system could be exactly what the big man needs. No player created more kind of expected goals and kind of didn't fulfill those expected goals than Darwin Nunes last season. No player hit the post more than Darwin Nunes last season. Is it a point where it's luck? Or is it a point where he's just not good enough and a not good enough natural finisher? I'm kind of leaning towards the second one. It might, it might, you know, it could backfire this one. I'm a very, very big fan of Watkins from match day three onwards. So, you know, I might have to make some changes, maybe drop Semeno down to a 4.5 so we can potentially get uh, Watkins in around game week three, game week four, if Darwin isn't living up to the hype. But like I said, Ipswich in game week one, defensively, they weren't great in the championship. So definitely a team I feel that could very much have the same kind of Luton vibe like last season. You know, they, they were heroic, but at the same time, they were still pretty naff in defence and definitely a team that, you know, a lot of us benefited from with some of our picks. So Darwin's in there, but I'm a bigger fan of Watkins and I also like João Pedro as a potential option. When the game drops, those might potentially change. Moving on to Erling Haaland. Again, we did speak about him and his kind of uh, captaincy appeal over the, uh, the course of the opening 10 game weeks. They play Ipswich in game week two as well. And for me, with him having the armband, I still imagine he's probably going to be the most owned player in match day one as well. So for me personally, I still think he's worth having at the moment. But I think throughout the course of the season, if he's not looking good or maybe, you know, potentially seeing some rotation or not, you know, kind of performing up to the levels we've expected from him, definitely will be a player that I will be looking to replace this season with him having that steeper price tag. Moving on to a man who made my season towards the back end of the year. It was Alexander Isak. We spoke about the strong Newcastle fixtures they've got at the start of the season. So I'm very, very happy to have him in there as well. He realistically should be playing for a top team. Like, no offence Newcastle, no offence Newcastle fans. He should be playing for an Arsenal, a Liverpool, a City, because he is that good. He is levels above everybody else at Newcastle United. A newly promoted team at home on the opening day. That, to me, just sounds like a recipe for success. Let me know what you think of my initial mock draft down in the comments section. If you've got any questions about the game or when the game's going to be released, get them in the comments as well, and we'll have a nice little discussion down there. Like I said, we are trying to hit 6,000 subscribers by the start of the Premier League season. So if you do want to help me out, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. But thank you very much for watching today, ladies and gentlemen, and good luck in game week one.